Uh, it is an exciting subject because the president said we can see things happening that were recorded so long ago, centuries, millennia ago, being fulfilled before our eyes. And this gives us a wonderful reassurance that this is a special book, the Bible. It is the word of God and we can see it, uh, a, a book that can guide us today in things that are happening. The Bible tells us that the centre of the world's attention, the centre of the Bible's attention, is focused on the Middle East and especially on God's nation, the nation of Israel. And this is where we should be looking to see the fulfilment of the word of God. Keep our eyes on Israel, on the Middle East and the situation around there. Because what the Bible tells us that many nations are going to come together in order to destroy the nation of Israel. They're not going to succeed. They will succeed for a little while, but not for long, because the Lord Jesus is going to intervene in the affairs of the world and prevent that. But the Bible talks about this great battle, the Battle of Armageddon, where nations are divided into two groups, those that are for Israel, those that are against Israel. And nations such as Russia, EU, Vatican, Iran, Turkey, uh, Libya is another country that is actually mentioned. These countries band together to destroy Israel as a nation. And so initially they succeed. But there are nations who are opposed to this invasion of Israel. And the Bible lists them, and among them, we believe, is Britain, uh, Commonwealth countries such as Canada and New Zealand and the United States and Australia, not named as nations, but we shall look at the symbology and see how appropriate it is for the Commonwealth countries. Uh, and alongside them will be Arab nations. This is so interesting to Bible students because until recently, Arab nations were very much against Israel. But now things have changed. We believe this is another indication that we're near to the coming of the Lord Jesus, that nations are realigning in their attitude to Israel, either for Israel or against Israel. And so the time's going to come, and whether Putin will still be there is a very mute question at the moment, but uh, Russia and this uh, confederacy of nations will come down first of all into Turkey and to take Constantinople uh, and then sweep down with ships and down the maritime coast into Egypt and secure the southern flank and then come up and take Israel. And Daniel chapter 11 uh, indicates that for a while he successfully plants his tabernacles of his palace in Jerusalem between the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. But other scriptures and Ezekiel 38 indicate that there are these nations who are opposed to this invasion. And one of the key verses is in Ezekiel chapter 38, and I'll just read it now, but we're going to tease it out as we go later through our talk. Uh, Sheba and Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, and all the young lions thereof, shall say unto thee, Gog, uh, art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? So obviously these nations are opposed to what is happening. And because Tarshish is in there, this is part of our subject. So we will look and see who Sheba and Dedan are, who the merchants of Tarshish are, and who the young lions are. But let's just concentrate for the moment on Tarshish and build up a picture of Tarshish in the past, Tarshish now, Tarshish in the future, guided by scripture. Um, we believe, just putting it very simply, that the Tarshish power of today is Britain and the young lions are the Commonwealth countries and the Sheba and Dedan are the Arab countries, but we'll look at that in detail. But just to give you a picture uh, of where we're heading. So where does Tarshish come from? Well, Genesis chapter 10 is the table of nations telling us how uh, from Noah and his three sons, 
the whole earth was repopulated. And in Genesis chapter 10, it tells us that Tarshish was the son of Javan. Uh, and if we just look at the table down below, we can see Noah, Japheth, Javan, uh, and Tarshish and his three brothers. And it tells us about Tarshish and his brothers that by these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families in their nations. Uh, your version puts it from these maritime peoples spread out into their territories by their clans within their nations, each with its own language. So it's telling us that the maritime people are descended from Javan, uh, and one of them was Tarshish. And so from coming out from the Ark on Mount Ararat, they migrated eastward, sorry, westward, uh, into the Mediterranean uh, area. And the four sons of Javan, we, we trace Elisha to Italy in that region there, uh, Kittim, uh, we associate with Cyprus, uh, Dadanim with Greece, uh, and Tarshish uh, over into Spain. So this is where they moved to, but they didn't stop still. We believe that they moved onwards, uh, and Tarshish especially, who was uh, associated with Spain, moved onwards and upwards, a uh, um, long time ago in time of Abraham and probably before Abraham uh, and reached the shores of Britain. So this is where the Tarshish and Javan sons uh, are associated with this region here. Now Britain, uh, sorry, the, the Bible associates Tarshish and Tyre very closely. So let's just see where um, oh, I didn't put click on the one that I done him. So where, where is Tyre in ancient days? Where was it? Well, it was in what we call today Lebanon, uh, Beirut. That's the capital of Lebanon. And to the south was uh, a, a port, which was Sidon. Uh, again, mentioned many times in the Bible and very closely linked with Tyre. And Tyre was the southernmost uh, port not very far from the northern border of Israel of today. Uh, Tyre and Zidon, probably about 25 miles, uh, 40 kilometers uh, apart. But they were two thriving ports. Now, again, we can, and they are very closely linked together. They were both Phoenician seaports in Bible times. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us the origin of Tyre directly but it does tell us the origin of Sidon. Uh, again, if we go back to Genesis chapter 10, we see that Ham, uh, the father of Canaan, Canaanites that lived in the region of where Israel is today, his firstborn son was Sidon. So, and from him came the Phoenicians. So the Phoenicians are associated with Ham, uh, the second son of Noah. Um, just by the way, you might wonder why I put Japheth, Ham and Shem, because in the Bible we read of Shem, Ham and Japheth. And that's because the Bible is all concerned with uh, Shem, from whom came the uh, Jews. That's what the Bible's all about, God's dealings with the Jews, and so Shem is put first. But Genesis 10 verse 21 tells us that actually Japheth was the firstborn, uh, and Shem was actually the lastborn of Noah's three sons, but that's just a, a minor point there. So where does Tyre fit in? Traditionally, people would say, well, uh, Tyre is a descendant of Zidon, one of the Phoenician uh, countries. And yes, it was a Phoenician uh, port, but there's an interesting little verse, and we'll come to it a bit later on in Isaiah 23, which talks about uh, Tyre, being the daughter of Tarshish. Now, that might be a figure of speech, but it could be a historical fact that one of the descendants of Tarshish married into uh, perhaps a clan or moved because they saw the opportunities of having a, a port 
uh, in this central region of the world, as it were, uh, out and move there, but very soon integrated with the surrounding countries uh, and adopted Phoenician idolatry and became known as a Phoenician country. So we can't be sure of the actual origin of Tyre. But there are many passages which speak about uh, Tyre and Tarshish of events which seem to lie ahead of Bible times. And I've just pulled them together here. Um, Psalm 48 talks about a time when the ships of Tarshish are broken with an east wind. Uh, and Isaiah 23 has a, a similar thing. Howl ye ships of Tarshish for your strength is laid waste. Um, Isaiah chapter 2 talks about the judgments of God uh, and it will be upon the ships of Tarshish. And Isaiah 60 uh, speaks about the isles that are far off shall wait for me and the ships of Tarshish first to bring thy sons from far, their silver and their gold with them unto the name of Yahweh thy God, unto the Holy One of Israel, because he hath glorified thee. So that's something that hasn't happened. This is talking about the time when the Lord Jesus is back on the earth and this Tarshish power will use her ships in order to help bring the Jews back to their land, having been scattered out of it um, at this battle of Armageddon. And there are still a lot of Jews scattered around the world. Only half the Jews are, are back in the land of Israel. So there's a work here for a Tarshish, a latter-day Tarshish power um, to bring God's people back to the land. Uh, Ezekiel 38 is uh, what we've read, and we're going to deal with that in a bit more detail. Psalm 72 talks about the kings of Tarshish and of the isles bringing their presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. And again, in the context, it is of the Lord Jesus as king of Israel, king of the world. These nations will submit their thrones to the new king in Israel. Uh, and bring presents and help in the work of rebuilding Israel after this terrible time of having been conquered by these uh, enemies. Uh, and lastly there, Psalm 45, the daughter of Tyre shall be there with a gift, even the rich among the people shall entreat thy favour. Again, a picture of a future time when a Tyre power will be there uh, offering gifts to the new king. And then Isaiah 66 again speaks of, I will send to those that escape of them unto the nations, to Tarshish, Pul and Lud that draw the bow, to Tubal and Javan, to the isles afar off that have not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory, and they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. Again, a picture of nations afar off from Bible lands. Uh, who in Bible times didn't have the gospel preached to them, but uh, now are, are part of God's kingdom and working with the new king. And just finally, uh, in Luke chapter 10, it talks about it be more tolerable for Tyre and Zidon at the judgment than for you. So building up a picture, Tarshish power, uh, uh, we know Javan's sons, uh, including Tarshish, were maritime people. So we're looking for a, a, a latter-day Tarshish power that is a maritime power, uh, closely associated with Tyre. And this is uh, that verse, Isaiah 23, Tyre is described as the daughter of Tarshish. And it was Tarshish ships that traded, uh, bringing wealth from far off Tarshish to Tyre, to the marketplace there, and then distributed around the Middle East. And we're actually told of some of the things that Tarshish supplied to the markets in Tyre, described in Ezekiel chapter 27, uh, as all sorts of riches, but they included silver, iron, tin, and lead. And we'll see the significance of that in a moment. And there is a future role. There has to be a latter-day Tarshish power uh, in, in order to fulfil what scripture says uh, Tyre's going to do, Tarshish is going to do. And they've got to be an island people and are far off from Israel. 
Now, the, there were two rival groups in the Mediterranean. There were Greeks uh, and there were Phoenicians. The Phoenicians uh, were mainly in the south here and the Greeks were in the north. And I, I think a lot of the Greeks are descended from uh, Javan, Tarshish and his family. Uh, that was the area they operated in. And I think they continued their trade there. But what is so significant is that they traded up with Britain, way up to the north there. And as I say, I believe that we can trace Tarshish to Britain. That the early Britons were descended from Tarshish. So uh, these are Carthage, uh, Tartarus. Um, Cornwall was a great centre for trade, for tin and lead and iron. Um, Wales too, and uh, copper from there, and also gold from uh, Ireland. These, these were places that in the time of the prophets, uh, ships from Tyre were going up to that region, bringing back this wealth to the marketplace. And this is confirmed by somebody who had no Bible acts at all. This is the Penguin Atlas of world history showing in the time of the Phoenicians, a time when Ezekiel was writing, um, that the tin and the lead came from uh, Britain. Britain was known as the Cassiterides, Cassiterides, the tin islands, because this was the wealth of, where the wealth of tin was found in the Cornwall. And tin was so important in that day because it helped to make copper into bronze made it much harder. So it was a very important ingredient uh, and so was highly valued. And we know that the tin industry in Cornwall goes way back uh, to the time of the prophets. There's uh, Her Majesty's Stationery Office published a very dry sounding book. If you wanted to go to sleep, this, I recommend you read this book. The metallurgist re mining regions of southwest England. And if you look, look at the thickness of the spine there, there's over uh, 550 pages to it. But our interest is in chapter three, economic minerals. And I'll just enlarge it up so we can read it. And just bear in mind what Ezekiel said, that from Tarshish comes all sorts of riches, but especially silver, iron, tin, and lead. So what does this book say about the mining in this region of Cornwall? The principal economic minerals of South West England are, of course, tin and copper ores, considerable amount of ores of lead, zinc, silver, arsenic, antimony, sulphur, iron and manganese have also been raised. The date of the discovery of tin in the West of England is not known, but we know it was produced about 2,500 years ago. Now, this was written 50 years ago, so that very much coincides with the time of Ezekiel. Now, what is so fascinating is that in very recent times, just three years ago, there was this confirmation that tin did indeed come from Cornwall to uh, Israel and Tyre. And that's when they found some tin ingots in shipwrecks off the coast of Israel. And with modern techniques, they're able to uh, look at the uh, constitution of this metal and can tell you exactly which mine in Cornwall it came from. And um, when they analysed these, which as I say were found in a shipwreck, uh, off the coast of Israel, didn't quite achieve it, went all that way, nearly got to Tyre, um, but uh, were wrecked before they got there. Uh, and this they can trace back, and it goes back uh, to the time of uh, 1300 BC, so well before the time of the prophets, we're going back to the time of, uh, or well, Abraham was 2000, King David was 1000, so uh, before the time of King David. So this is, this is confirmation that there was this ancient trade from this tin island from Tarshish. 
And then just a couple of weeks ago, um, another interesting, it's not terribly strong evidence, but they have found that there were two uh, different sources of um, ancient Britons. One down in Cheddar seems to be a very um, primitive tribe uh, and associated with cannibalism. But up in Wales, at the Great Orm, where there's a very huge uh, Bronze Age copper mine, there was uh, an ancient skeleton in there. And when they did a DNA analysis on this skeleton, they found that it had come from the Mediterranean region. Now, this might have been a Phoenician uh, ship person on the boat and had ended up there, or it could well be a Tarshish person himself who was working in the mine. But it, it, it links Britain and ancient Britons with the Middle East, with um, uh, maritime people. So that was a, an interesting little extra confirmation. So let's look at Britain, the Tarshish power. Now, if you've got your Bibles, can you please open to, let's just move that out of the way, to Isaiah chapter 23, which is a key passage which tells us, I'll say this was written 2,500 years ago, roughly. And God told Isaiah that this amazing tire maritime power was going to come to an end. And that was something which was almost unbelievable because they were a very strong power and had an extensive network. But God said they would come to an end. And just picking up, I've got verses five to seven on the screen there. Um, As at the report concerning Egypt, so shall they be sorely pained at the report of Tyre. God had forecast that, that Egypt, which again was a mighty nation, but that would collapse. And now he's saying, Tyre, this mighty nation, is going to collapse. Uh, And what does he say? Pass ye over to Tarshish. Howl ye inhabitants of the isle. Is this your joyous city whose antiquity is of ancient days? Her own feet shall carry her afar off to Sodom. Now, I haven't highlighted the word isle there. I should have done, because... In the time of Isaiah, Tyre was on the mainland. It wasn't on an island. So this seemed to be wrong right from the beginning. But everyone had to wait uh, 100, 110 years. Days of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar laid siege to mainland Tyre. And because they're a maritime power with ships, they escaped in ships from mainland Tyre onto a nearby island and Tyre resumed its power as an island, so it wasn't wrong. But that wasn't the end of Tyre. It wasn't until Alexander the Great, another 200 years on from Nebuchadnezzar, that Alexander the Great came along and besieged mainland Tyre. In fact, took the stones of uh, mainland Tyre, built a causeway to the island, uh, and so took the island, and that brought the power of Tyre, um, it broke it. It didn't disappear entirely, but over the next uh, while, it it, uh, disappeared from history. So what this is saying is that they're going to be on an island, which at the time of the prophecy wasn't the case, but later on was in time of Nebuchadnezzar, and they were going to eventually disappear and eventually end up at Tarshish, Britain, and her own feet shall carry her afar off to Sodom there. And then verse 10 says, and this is where it talks about the daughter of Tyre, pass she through thy land, Tyre, as a river, O daughter of Tarshish, there is no more strength. But what what I'm interested in is how her own feet carried her afar off. And if we look at history, we can see that. Alexander the Great broke the power of Tyre and, in fact, established down in Egypt, Alexandria, named after himself. And that for uh, nine and a thousand years. 
uh, was the main centre of maritime power. In fact, in New Testament, we read about ships from Alexandria um, used by the apostles. But that came to an end, and uh, around about 800 AD, it moved to Venice, and Venice was the maritime centre. That lasted for quite a time, but then moved across to Genoa. Genoa flourished, and then from there it moved down to Lisbon, and Lisbon was in the 14, 1500s. At the same time, the maritime power then moved up to Amsterdam in the 1500s, the 1700s, but seemed to then have gone across to Britain and London. And the Elizabethan age was the age when Britain had a maritime fleet and became a worldwide trading country, built up an empire on the back of Protestantism and the Bible. And that's where we believe that the Tarshish power is gone back to, the Tyre power has gone back to its main supplier of those precious metals, gone back to Britain, and there it resides. So Britain is Tyre and it is Tarshish. So let's look now at Ezekiel chapter 38, and that's a chapter that describes the invasion of uh, Israel by Gog. Um, we haven't time to look at that it's subject all on its own, but it's just these nations which are in opposition, which are described in verse 13, which I've got on the screen and we've already read. So what we need to know, who are Sheba and Dedan? Who are the merchants of Tarshish? Who are the young lions? Well, in the Bible, there are, in, uh, in the book of Genesis, it, it tells us of two Dedans and three Shebas. Uh, there was a Dedan in the north of Saudi Arabia. There was a Dedan at what is today Bahrain, and they spread downwards into what we call the UAE of today. And the three Shebas all seem to congregate in the south and are associated with the spice trade. Now, there were many generations between these different Shebas. So uh, as a new Sheba generation came along, they seemed to just settle in the same region, integrate with what was there. If they were more powerful, take over. So Sheba and Dedan seems to be biblical shorthand for this uh, Gulf region. It is pointing us to there. And so what we're seeing before our eyes is a grouping of nations. The Abraham Accords have brought the uh, UAE and Bahrain uh, and other countries are interested in becoming part of it, Oman and Saudi Arabia. Uh, Sudan also is uh, in that grouping, but because of military problems just at the moment, nothing much is happening there. But uh, we see nations there we are now friendly with israel and then we see a grouping of nations to the north iran turkey and uh, syria very much opposed to israel turkey is just doing a little bit about term but basically turkey is against israel and so we see a southern grouping of nations and a northern grouping of nations this is something we've been looking for for a long time, seeing it come to pass between our eyes. And this is laying the foundations for nations friendly to Israel, nations against Israel, backed by other countries off the map, uh, Europe and Russia, coming against her. So Britain, as the Tarshish power, she does tick all the boxes. She is an island power. She is a maritime power. She is to the extreme west of Israel. She, it says the merchants of Tarshish, so a plural. And the United Kingdom consists of England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. And these are all merchant countries which work together. And if she's got young lions, then that's an indication that she seems to be a mother lion. And that's the cartoonist's favourite depiction of Britain, isn't it, as a lion, an old lion, because she has young lions, the Commonwealth. 
And these Commonwealth countries are now independent. They're not cubs, they're grown up, but they choose to work with Britain when they need to. Britain is the source of all the metals that were brought from Tarshish in ancient times. She's so very much allied to Israel and the early Britons, we believe, are descended from Tarshish himself. Now, we're going back to Isaiah 23 because that, that's told us what's going to happen and over many hundreds of years that took place that Tyre eventually ended on the shores of Tarshish. But Isaiah 23, I should have asked you just to keep a marker in there, but just go back a few books and get to Isaiah. Isaiah 23 then goes on to paint a picture of the latter days. And it, it talks about this latter day Tyre Tarshish power being forgotten for 70 years, according to the days of one king. And the end of 70 years shall Tyre sing as an harlot. Now, we can't fit that into any previous history of ancient Tyre and the Bible times, but we believe that this is a picture of today. And very strangely, it talks about a period of 70 years according to the days of one king or one ruler. Reigning for 70 years is a very unusual thing. Kings and queens don't normally reign that long. So Queen Elizabeth, who reigned for 70 years plus, was a, a unique, the first British ruler. You can count on one hand the rulers around the world that have reign for 70 years uh, and here we are we are uh, we believe with the death of the queen at the end of 70 year period we are at the stage where britain is going to rebuild herself having left europe brexit uh, and focusing not on europe but on israel the middle east and the far east is going to build up her trade and be a trading power. And it uses the figure of an harlot, that this tire is going to be, uh, which she shall return to her hire. Uh, and that word hire, there's two words in scripture. If I employed you to do a job and you got your hire, that's one word. If I employ a prostitute, well, that's a very different word in Hebrew. And this is the word that's used here. So here's a picture of a country that's turned its back on its God and its ancient history and is worshipping the idols of the world. And that, we believe, is a very true picture of Britain today. She's seeking to do trade with all sorts of countries. Uh, she's turned her back on Protestantism. She's had a Roman Catholic uh, prime minister. Now she's got a Hindu prime minister and nobody turns a hair. But, you know, when you think of the roots of Britain and the Bible and uh, Protestantism, then in God's eyes, this is like being an harlot. Uh, and she's wanting to trade with all nations, uh, of, commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world upon the face of the earth. So she wants to do worldwide trade, and that's exactly what Britain sees as her future, a worldwide trading power. But ultimately, as we shall see at the end, that wealth that she gains is going to be used in God's service. So here is a picture of the lifetime of the Queen uh, and her reign of 70 years and 214 days, no significance in the 214 days, but she reigned over 70 years. So in February of this year, she completed that 70 years and then died in this September. And we believe that indicates that we're now in this period when Britain is going to break away from Europe and do this worldwide trade. Now, there's something very remarkable about this, because many of you will have seen this book, The Servant Queen and the King She Serves, which was uh, issued for her 90th birthday, so six years ago. And she had a big influence on what, it is written, what was written in here. 
and her devotion to the service of the Lord Jesus Christ. She believed in his return, his coming. Uh, she looked forward to laying her crown at his feet, but not to be. But in the middle of the book is uh, an open Bible. Let's put it up on the screen there. And the remarkable thing is that that Bible is open at Isaiah 23. Probably won't be able to read that, but I do assure you the burden about Tyre, it's uh, Isaiah chapter 23. Now, it may well be the Queen understood what we understand about Tyre and Tarshish of the latter days. It can't have been a coincidence of all the chapters to have the Bible open, Isaiah 23. And of course, the wonderful thing about the Queen, while she held the Commonwealth together, without a steady hand, it would have long disappeared. When she came to the throne, there were only nine members. When she died, there were 54 members. And we believe that was all God's preparation for today. Now Britain wants to be a worldwide trading power again. She needs the Commonwealth countries scattered around the world. And as this headline said, the Queen saved the Commonwealth. Without her steady influence, it would long have gone. And the Commonwealth gives Britain a boost. So Singers and Harlot, this was just over a month ago. Britain's pride and joy, the Queen Elizabeth II uh, aircraft carrier docked in New York Harbour and Catherine Jenkins and the Royal Marine Bands were there to play and to sing to 500 dignitaries who were gathered in New York to come onto this boat and to listen to a lecture. This was the um, the Fifth Atlantic Future Forum gathering. And what they were being told, the Great Britain and Northern Ireland campaign, great, is the government's flagship international communications programme. The objective <clears throat> is to drive economic growth across the entire nation by encouraging an international audience to visit study, trade, invest, and live and work in the United Kingdom. Great <clears throat> invites the world to see things differently and to see a fresh side of the UK. Great showcases the UK as dynamic, outward-looking, confident, collaborative, bringing unconventional thinking to the global challenges we face. So that was quite a remarkable thing that the world is told Come and have another look at Britain. Come and trade. Put your headquarters in Britain. We're different. We're going to do things differently now. And here is the United Kingdom, quite a small population, ranked 21st in the world by population, 0.84 of the world's population, but punches her weight far more, punches far above her weight. <coughs> and here we have this Commonwealth. Countries spread around the world, anxious to do trade with Britain, stepping off places for Britain to extend trade outwards from these countries. And Britain has determined, and this was two years ago, made the decision that we're going to focus our trade upon the Indo-Pacific region. So that includes the Middle East and eastward India, and the right over to the Asian countries. And of course, Britain needs maritime power if she's going to be a worldwide trading company because 90% of the world's trade is carried by ships. As far as UK is concerned, 95% of her trade is transported by sea. And so here we have our new Secretary of State for International Trade, Kemi. Ratnock. She is of Nigerian origin, so again her interest is in Commonwealth. We have a new Prime Minister who is of Indian origin. India is very much one of the key uh, Commonwealth countries. And so we see this, this shift of emphasis away from Europe uh, 
to this region. Um, Britain's very busy doing trade deals with Israel, uh, trade deals with India. They'd hoped to got it wrapped up by Bali, but because of all the problems in Britain, it didn't happen. But now with the new impetus of the uh, new prime minister, uh, they are very keen that that will get wrapped up very shortly. And also, Britain is very keen to do trade deals with the Gulf countries. And that's so significant because this is the region of Sheba and Didan that Britain wants to do a trade deal. And these people have got lots of money to invest in Britain. And so there's a very lucrative market there. So after a period of about 70 years when Britain was in decline, forced to join the common market, but has now come out as this opportunity to forge ahead. And it's interesting, Britain already has got uh, bases in the region um, scattered around, another one in the Indian Ocean. So of her um, 16 overseas bases, six of them are in this region. The very latest one is in Oman. And there, Britain and America have poured money into the building of this state-of-the-art port. Um, Britain's uh, can accommodate both the aircraft carrier and all her nuclear submarines in this port. India too, interestingly, has been given rights that their navy can use this port. So the state-of-the-art port still finishing it off uh, and this is going to be the centre where at least one of the aircraft carriers is going to be based. Uh, and from there, it can project its power into this region where she is wanting to go. So finally, Isaiah 23, we've still got it open, the last verse there says, Her merchandise and her hire shall be holiness to Yahweh. It shall not be treasured nor laid up, for her merchandise shall be for them that dwell before Yahweh to eat sufficiently and for durable clothing. Doesn't sound very exciting as it eats sufficiently and durable clothing, but when one looks in the Hebrew, to eat sufficiently is actually to eat to the full, so you can't eat any more. Abundance of food. And the word durable has the idea of eminent, surpassing, absolutely glorious clothing. So this wealth that we believe Britain is about to build up is going to be used to the glory of God. So we very quickly just draw things together. The Lord Jesus is coming back. He's going to raise his dead followers, gather his living followers to him. After that, the land of Israel is going to be invaded uh, and the Lord Jesus and his saints are going to come to deliver Israel, to destroy these nations that have come against God's people, to destroy them. And Jesus is going to set himself up as the king of the Jews. That's what he died and see. This is Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. When he ascended, the angels promised his coming back to fulfill that role. And as well as being king of Israel, he's going to be king of the world. All nations are going to submit to his rule. And uh, countries like Britain, we believe from what scripture tells us, will devote their efforts to helping the Lord Jesus, say, bringing back the Jews and the ships, helping in the building of the temple that will be the center of worship for the world, uh, helping in whatever way they can, the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a wonderful gospel message. This is what the Bible's all about, the hope of Israel being with the Lord Jesus in this wonderful time to educate the world in the ways of God. I just want to close with the, just the last slide here. This wonderful picture in Isaiah chapter 2 of what it will be like when Jesus is king and the nations have submitted to him. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of Yahweh's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, shall be exalted above the hills, all nations shall flow unto it. 
And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways. We will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. And he, Israel's king, the Lord Jesus, will judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. What a wonderful prospect that is, our friends, that there is a better future. The world looks so hopeless, but it's all leading to the kingdom of God. And we can be on the side of the Lord Jesus if we accept the Bible and the Bible message and choose to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there is a wonderful future. And Britain has a role to play, but you can have a role in it as well.